thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to another of our ongoing webinars. Our speaker tonight is Bruce Gamble, uh, whom I'm sure you've all come to know, and uh, he's a much loved regular fixture here in our webinar program. Uh, Bruce spent eight years in naval aviation during the Cold War, specializing in electronic warfare. Uh, after several deployments in the Indian and Pacific Ocean, Bruce returned to Pensacola as an instructor. Uh, but Bruce, ultimately medically retired um, after a run-in with cancer. He's been cancer-free uh, since that time, but he began a volunteer career at the National Museum of Naval Aviation down in Pensacola, and that really kind of helped set his love of history. Uh, we've introduced Bruce a few times, so um, in, in the interest of, of a little bit of variation from those past introductions, um, I went ahead and asked Bruce why um, he was specifically interested in Rabal. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Bruce's three books, uh, three book series on Rabal um, is one of the most respected works on that period in history and on that specific geographic location um, that are available anywhere. And Bruce described having heard about it from his uncle, which those of you who attended the previous webinar about the Kangaroo Squadron, you'll remember that his uncle was, was in the Kangaroo Squadron, and obviously they had attacked Rabal several times. Um, he also mentioned that while working on his first book about the Black Sheep Squadron, um, he heard the sense of awe in how Rabal was described by the men of that unit as well. And, and drawing these lines between different wartime experiences and how they all interconnected back to Rabal with a kind of respect for the toughness and tenacity of the defenders uh, made Bruce eager to find out why Rabal was spoken about in that way by American aviators. Um, and as so often happens, uh, what started out as one book became three. So Bruce, I think you're gonna try to uh, ultimately compress it back down into a single presentation for us here tonight. But uh, I think you've got us all very eager to hear more about the uh, the Fortress of Rabal. Well, thanks Keegan. It's a pleasure to be back again with the museum. Uh, let me know if anything needs to be adjusted level-wise, but uh, I think we're ready to go and if uh, if we're all set, I'll I'll launch this thing. Um, first slide, just the title page here, and uh, see if it's going to advance for me. There we go. Uh, these are the three books that Keegan made a quick reference to. It started out being one book and then morphed into a big project that ended up being about 1,200 pages worth of history about one place. Um, over the books came out over a span of about four or five years from the first to the last. And the first book originally was titled Darkest Hour, and it's uh, the story of an Australian garrison at Rabaul at the beginning of World War II. And that was a standalone book. And then when I started working on the air war over Rabaul that followed later on, then the whole thing just kind of made sense to form it into a trilogy and the publisher zenith press agreed with that uh, idea and so the first book was actually retitled to invasion Rabal to kind of fit the whole pattern of of having everything sort of fit into a little scheme here so those are the three titles <clears throat> and i'm really going to concentrate though tonight on the first book as a as a highlight and then hit some important points from the second two books to tell uh, a pretty good overview of what was going on at Rabal. But I think that first story about the Australians that really captured my interest is worth repeating in a little bit more detail tonight. I really have to argue that uh, the battle for Rabal could be considered World War II's longest battle, and here's why. It's, it began, the actual combat began in, in early January of 1942 and continued until VE Day and actually beyond VE Day because the Japanese did not surrender Rabaul until September of 1945. So even my own graphic up here is a little bit inaccurate. Uh, the war officially ended on August 15th, 1945, but for the people at Rabal, it didn't end for another four or five weeks. And within an area about of about 100 square miles, which is equal roughly to the size of Tallahassee or Savannah or a city of, of equal size, within that small area, 
all these things happened during those three and a half years, not always concurrently, but all of these different types of combat occurred in this one small geographic area, the high altitude bombing by Japanese planes when it was an Australian, uh, Australian possession, and then later high altitude bombing by B-17s and B-24s, uh, lower altitudes by B-26s for, for a while. Um, there were dive bombing attacks by Japanese and Americans. There were torpedo attacks by American planes, skip bombing. It's really fascinating to think of all the different kinds of aerial combat that occurred in this one small area. Not to mention that there were also land battles during the Japanese invasion. There was an amphibious landing, all kinds of infantry engagements. That was pretty short lived. In fact, only lasted one day, pretty much. Um, and then there were also sea engagements as far as uh, even within Simpson Harbor, which we'll point out here a little bit, uh, there was bombardment. And then, of course, anti-aircraft fire from uh, naval anti-aircraft guns. So it, there really was an air, land, and sea component to the combat that occurred in this small area. Just to kind of put Rabal in perspective on a large area map, we have pretty much the entire Pacific here with Hawaii up in the far right corner. And of course, the part of mainland China in the upper left and the continent of Australia, kind of this big anchor down at the bottom south of the equator. And Rabal is pretty much central to all of that. With the ring around it, you can kind of see where the Solomon Islands go down to the southeast and the Big Island in New Guinea, due west of Rabal. So from Rabal, there's a capability of reaching a pretty wide area of territory in the Southwest Pacific. And that's why it became such a vital location. Here's a little bit closer zoom that shows part of New Guinea and how rugged with a topographical relief in the map, you can see the uh, ruggedness of New Guinea and even the islands there, the island of New Britain being the largest of the Bismarck archipelago, and Rabal is right at the northern tip of that island. And then, of course, again, we have the Solomon Islands going down towards the southeast, and there's a little mark there on the island of Guadalcanal, which became important a little bit later on in the war, and we'll talk about that some. Zooming in even closer now, here's the actual northern tip of New Britain with the city of Rabal, and you can see the city streets laid out there in a east-west, north-south grid. And the peninsula that's right above the city and kind of wraps around almost like the, a finger being crooked. If you hold your left hand up and crook your index finger, it sort of looks like that. And you can see the topographical lines on the map that show these volcanic mountains there were so many volcanoes surrounding Rabal that it was known as Volcano Town. And that peninsula with all of those topical, topographical marks on it was Crater Peninsula. There are two airfields shown on the map that were there as part of the Australian territory. And since we're talking about Australia, let's go on and show why this became so important before World War II. It started because Rabal has this great anchorage. And when development occurred from Western influence, when I, the exploration and, and colonialism and so forth, uh, all the explorers recognized pretty early on that the anchorage here at Rabal was, was superb. And if I go back to the previous slide, you can see that there's a narrow entrance into the harbor down to the lower right part of the map. And from that narrow entrance, everything else is protected by the ring of mountains all the way around this whole area. And in fact, the whole thing, uh, Blanche Bay and Simpson Harbor are all actually part of a collapsed caldera. And there's a really, really fascinating volcanic history behind all of this. So back to the anchorage. This is taken in the late 1800s, early 1900s, back in the age of sail. Rabal was initially colonized by um, Imperial Germany 
and they, with their beautiful architecture and, and engineering, built a beautiful little city there to support the Anchorage and the industries there, uh, mainly uh, revolving around the production of copra or copra, depending on how you want to pronounce that. But the, the coconut industry became huge in that whole region. And Rabal was pretty much the industrial and commercial headquarters of all of the copper industry going on for generations in the in the early days before World War II. So the beautiful hotels and other public buildings. This is the New Guinea Club for the elite, uh, surrounded by all kinds of beautiful um, casuarina trees, and uh, it's really it was a, a beautiful well-engineered, well-designed town with lots of floral gardens and a lot of charm. Uh, the charm kind of came to a crashing end in 1937 when two of the volcanoes erupted. Actually, <clears throat> the one that's shown to the right with the red ring around it erupted first and then another uh, opened up in the harbor and actually created overnight a 600 foot new mountain of ash and pumice and and other disgorged material that came up out of that caldera and about 500 lives were lost in the immediate area during that eruption <clears throat> excuse me so all of a sudden Rebal went from being this really charming tropical town into a, a real nightmare uh, covered with feet worth of ash and uh, it was almost ruined, but uh, slowly climbed back. Uh, World War I had ended up uh, causing the uh, German, uh, causing Imperial Germany to turn over uh, Rabaul and other territories to Australia and Japan in the South Pacific. So Rabaul became the capital of the New Guinea Territory, an Australian possession at the end of World War I. And in 1941, with all the rumblings of war going on with Japan and China, uh, belatedly, Australia decided to bring in a garrison and garrison Rabaul and protect the two airfields there. This was the unit, um, approximately 1,500 men total. I won't go through the whole uh, grouping here, but it's a combination of Rifle companies, uh, some light crew-fed weapons like mortars and, and machine guns, a small anti-tank battery. Uh, one of the more important elements was uh, a battery of two old World War I vintage anti-aircraft guns. And, and that's what they had for aerial defense. Other than the light machine guns were these two old three-inch guns. One of them had a cracked breech so they'd never test fired the guns before the Japanese attack. They just were afraid that if they fired them, they might ruin the guns. So they didn't even test fire them. All they did was tracked planes for practice and pretended to shoot them down. And that was, that was their training prior to the beginning of, of combat. There was also an aerial element there. Uh, the Australians had a composite squadron, 24 squadron, that consisted of some Lockheed Hudson twin engine light bombers. And people might recognize this. It's basically a license built version of the American T6 or SNJ, the uh, pretty well known uh, single engine two crew aircraft that's used as a trainer in the United States and Australia uh, was such a uh, militarily poor country at that time as a commonwealth that this was their frontline fighter at the beginning of World War II uh, with just rifle caliber machine guns and basically no armor, no uh, protection for the crew. And pretty anemic performance, especially when you compare it to the Japanese aircraft of the time. 
combat began over Rabaul in early January of 1942. The Japanese had their eye on Rabaul from way back, even six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Philippines and Balea. They had their eyes on the prize uh, as uh, Rabaul was already recognized for its anchorage and its capability and its defensibility. So uh, the Japanese intended to capture it even before they started other planning for their big southern offensive. They attacked first with a combination of big four-engine flying boats and also these twin-engine medium-sized level bombers, the, the Mitsubishi G3Ms that later became nicknamed by the Allies as the Nell. They attacked over a period of a couple of weeks and then on the 20th of January, a large-scale aerial attack came in against Rabaul by four of the carriers that had taken part in the attack on Pearl Harbor. You have the Akagi, Kaga, Shokaku, and Zuikaku with the same personnel who had attacked Pearl Harbor attacking Rabaul with more than 100 aircraft um, against seven of those wear away fighters that were able to get airborne and as you can imagine, can imagine, it was a very lopsided engagement. Um, none of the Japanese planes were shot down by any of the weirways, whereas all of the weirways were either shot down or forced down, um, or one, one I think went and hid in the clouds, um, self-preservation being the better part of valor. And uh, But basically, they, they weren't even in the fight. Interestingly, though, that pair of old three-inch anti-aircraft guns did score. Um, they actually scored a direct hit on a B-5N Kate that was being flown by an element leader off of the Shikaku, direct hit, and it crashed into the side slope of the largest volcano just north of Rabaul. Pretty good shooting for a crew that hadn't done any live fire training on that weapon. The invasion itself came early in the morning on January 23rd, with about 5,000 troops of the uh, South Seas Detachment and also some special uh, naval landing forces of the Japanese against the 1,500 or so defenders of Lark Force and the battle was pretty much over by noon of that day. So less than 10 hours from the invasion to the time when the Australians, they didn't surrender, but they basically just had to escape into the jungle uh, with what they had on their backs. And this was the South Seas detachment that invaded the um, 144th Infantry Regiment being the core. And uh, as you can see here, they had about 600 of what are often called Japanese Marines, but are more accurately members of the Special Naval Landing Forces. And uh, good troops, you know, well-trained, uh, really confident and well-organized. So it was a pretty short battle. Interestingly, the Japanese newspapers printed this photograph that's allegedly of troops at Rabaul during the attack. Of course, being the that it was the newspaper business, you never really know for sure if that's accurate, but this is what they published on the day that they announced the attacks on Rabaul. For the defenders, uh, hundreds of them basically just faded into the jungle and tried to make their way as far from Rabaul and as far from the Japanese as they could. Um, New Britain's about 200 or so, 250 miles long, so it's a pretty long hike from one end to the other and very mountainous. And the Australian troops ended up in three different places. Um, one place that wasn't a, a good outcome was the red circle that you can see on the right of this map near a place uh, labeled as Jackano Bay, there's a plantation there where about 150 Australians gathered uh, 
and they were captured by the Japanese and then massacred. About six escaped to be able to tell the story, but around 150, give or take, were shot and or bayoneted to death and just left to rot in the jungle and their remains were found later to prove the atrocity. Uh, the other contingents of uh, evaders ended up on the north coast or down on the south coast and it took them months to try to coordinate a rescue. And as you can see from this poor individual on the left, after four months of of dysentery and malaria and all kinds of disease, they were just practically starved. Um, and they were crowded aboard a couple of very small vessels that took them off of the island and eventually got them to Port Moresby where they were hospitalized and then on down into Australia for recovery. Uh, most of them never did return to uh, active military service afterwards. A few did uh, very notably and uh, and their stories are a really interesting part of the uh, series of books that I did. So only about 400 of the garrison managed to escape from New Britain. The balance, uh, mostly enlisted men, uh, about a thousand or so enlisted men and a couple of hundred civilian attorney, internees were loaded aboard a transport in July of 1942 that was gonna take them to Hainan Island off the coast of China to work uh, in basically in prison labor. But that ship was torpedoed in the South China Sea and, uh, and sank with all of the prisoners still aboard, uh, ostensibly locked down in the hold so they didn't have a prayer. Uh, the USS Sturgeon was the, was the uh, American submarine that fired the torpedoes. And it's interesting to note that Admiral Nimitz's son, Chester Jr., was one of the officers on that crew. This actually remains the uh, worst maritime disaster in Australian history with uh, I think around 1,050 or 1,100 um, soldiers and civilians uh, dead from that torpedoing. It wasn't a friendly fire incident. Uh, the ship was not carrying any markings that would determine that it was carrying prisoners. It was just a, what they called a hell ship and, uh, and it, it had gotten harm's way and, and was sunk. After the capture of Rabaul, the Japanese had been able to secure a pretty big area of territory. Um, so by early 42, this shaded area shows how much of the territory of the Pacific the Japanese now controlled. And you can understand why the people of Australia were extremely nervous that the Japanese were going to invade and that uh, there, it's almost hard to put into words or hard to express how close a thing it was that Australia was able to stay in the war on the side of the allies and, and wasn't forced to sue for peace or capitulate. Uh, the Japanese were pretty quick to start to fortify Rabaul. Uh, the Australians hadn't done much, but the Japanese did a lot. They put in hundreds of heavy air and aircraft guns. They they fortified the uh, landing areas the, or the potential landing sites with all kinds of big guns and concrete emplacements and machine guns and mortars. I mean, you're talking 6,000 machine guns and mortars in that small area going around that that, that ring that's shown in red. And uh, so anybody trying to invade the place was gonna face hell on earth really to, to try to make a landing. And then anybody trying to attack from the air had to literally go right through this ring of anti-aircraft guns, first on one side and hit the target and then go out through the same ring on the other side. And that doesn't even account for the guns on ships in the harbor. So the place was, to say it was heavily defended is really an understatement. A bunch of slides here are gonna show why the Japanese were able to capitalize on Rabaul 
and how their ambitions used Rabal and focused on Rabal as the key site. The red ring on this map is approximately the uh, effective combat range of Japanese aircraft flying out of Rabal. And you can see that ring goes all the way down to Guadalcanal. It's right at the edge of their range, but they could reach Guadalcanal direct from Rabal and fly back after after performing a bombing or fighter escort mission. The ring also goes considerably past Port Moresby on New Guinea. So you can see that that the uh, Japanese bombers and fighter aircraft from Rabal had a large area that they could cover from that one area, from that one site with, uh, with a couple of uh, airfields. Now, if they captured Port Moresby and developed Guadalcanal with an airfield, now see where these three rings extend. They could actually reach significant parts of the northern areas of Australia, uh, Queensland, and all the way down to Townsville. Uh, they could actually already reach Darwin from airfields up in Malaya um, and in the Celebes. So I didn't include that ring. I just wanted to include what they could reach from Rabal and the surrounding areas. But you can see now that their aerial superiority coverage would be very important if they captured Port Moresby. So that was their next big goal. And in the summer of 42, with a zoom up, we can see how much the Japanese controlled. Wherever you see the stars and, uh, and circle of the Allied uh, or American uh, national insignia there, that's what the Allies controlled. Milne Bay would come later, but Port Moresby and Horn Island were basically the only areas in around the southern part of New Guinea. And the Japanese had everything else, all the way down to a new airfield under construction on Guadalcanal. So a real umbrella of coverage with not only air bases, but also um, naval anchorages. So in 1942, a couple of really important events happened. MO operation or MO was the Japanese dual pronged attempt to capture Port Moresby and also the Australian anchorage at Tulagi over in the Solomon Islands. So they launched that in May, and that led to the very pivotal battle of Coral Sea, in which the Allies turned back the Japanese attempt to capture Port Moresby. And uh, even though the battle itself was a draw, uh, strategically, it was a victory for the Allies. So the, the real attempt by the Japanese to expand to that slide that I was talking about earlier was blunted. And more importantly, a couple of their primary aircraft carriers were badly damaged at Coral Sea, which kept them out of the fight for the Battle of Midway. Even though that was geographically not in the Rabal area, it had a big impact because of course the Japanese lost so heavily at Midway that they were never really a big threat again um, as far as their carrier fleet went. And that had a major impact on what was happening around the Southwest Pacific for the remainder of the war. And in July of 1942, the Japanese landed uh, more troops and, and established more sites on New Guinea. And then in August, the Allies invaded Guadalcanal, which they were able to do because, again, of the outcome of the Battle of Midway. That that really changed the dynamics and changed a lot of plans. And so the Allies had a successful invasion of Guadalcanal, followed by a very brutal and bitter six-month battle to keep it. So by early 1943, now you can see that the Allies are gaining some, some ground here. Now you have Allied uh, air bases over in, on Guadalcanal, and they've moved up to uh, the uh, Russell Islands just northwest of Guadalcanal. And also they've captured the Buna Gona area of New Guinea. So they're starting to push the Japanese up from the south and gain a little bit more territory. But at the same time, you can see how close to each other the bases are. I mean, we have Japanese and allied bases within an hour's flight of each other now. 
And so a lot of the movies and even the TV shows, like the, the Bob Bob Black Sheep TV series, where you see fighters coming in for a strafing attack, they could do that easily. They could just sweep in over the mountains or over the ocean and, and make a hit and run attack um, a surprise attack. And so these were the kinds of things that were happening again and again throughout this period. In 1943, then, some other really important events take place. The Japanese tried to reinforce Ley on New Guinea and sent out a big convoy from Rabaul that was discovered and just decimated in March of, of that year with uh, practically all the transports being sunk and uh, several destroyers sunk. I mean, the, the losses were were just catastrophic for the Japanese. They really didn't recover from that as far as being able to uh, reinforce or, or resupply their garrisons on New Guinea because by this time, the Allies had started to really gain aerial superiority. In April, Admiral Yamamoto launches his E-GO operation to try to uh, smash the Allies at Guadalcanal, and that largely fails. And he is uh, shot down and killed in April, uh, thanks to, in large part, to the Allies' uh, ability to read the Japanese naval code. Then in June, uh, the Allies, now with Admiral Halsey in control, start the island hopping campaign to really start to encircle the Japanese. And this is all part of what became called Operation Cartwheel, with the Allies island hopping from one island to the next. We don't have very many aircraft carriers left because we've lost our own by this time. We're, we're down to just a few, the Enterprise and the Saratoga. That's about all that's left by mid-1943, while the others are still being built that will come in and replace them. So the islands themselves kind of become the aircraft carriers, the stationary carriers, and uh, marine aviation and naval aviation use the islands to reinforce the operations that are moving from island to island. As soon as an island's captured, the CBs go in and improve the airfields, and uh, fighters go in and, and light attack go in, and then they can then extend on to the next island and cover the next series of landings. So it's kind of a ladder effect, using one rung at a time to go from island to island, sort of like a, a series of stepping stones. So throughout 1943, a lot of change happens. And at the end of the year in November, the Allies invade Bougainville. So now this next slide is going to really show how far the Allied uh, grip has extended. We've got all of the Solomons now, from Bougainville all the way down to Guadalcanal. So the fighting is not over. I mean, the Japanese are still on Bougainville, and it takes months to finally uh, declare the island secure. But even while the fighting's going on, we can get aircraft in at a place called Empress Augusta Bay, get aircraft onto some hastily built fields there, and now Rabaul is within fighter distance of American fighters, uh, Corsairs, um, you name it. The, uh, the game really started to change once Bougainville fell into Allied hands. And uh, as this graphic shows, now the, the Japanese are down to just four primary areas, and the Allies have eight or nine in, in hand. So by mid-1944, after the Allies capture uh, Manus Island in the Bismarck's, in the Admiralties, rather, uh, on the Bismarck Sea, now by mid-1944, Rabaul is just about encircled. Uh, the decision was made eventually never to uh, attempt an invasion, but to simply cut it off by encircling it and preventing the Japanese from resupplying their garrisons there. So it's really just a, a big chess game played out over a period of about two years. 
where the Japanese defended every island uh, almost to the last man if they could, um, but certainly with a lot of tenacity. And uh, every island hopping campaign was costly for the allies and it was a real grind. But over a, about a two year period from August of 42 to mid 1944, um, you can see pretty dramatically here from these series of maps, how the allies advanced and basically kicked the uh, Japanese out of each island one at a time. Now, so the story here, um, I've had a lot of maps in, in the graphics here. It's time to have a little bit more eye candy, I think, with uh, some better graphics. Just to kind of rehash what was occurring, we have uh, bomber air bomber raids for years and you know months and months over this two year period with uh, B-17s and B-24s flying out of New Guinea and Australia and all kinds of bases surrounding there. So we have heavy bombers. We've got the Japanese Zeros and Army fighters that uh, defended Rabaul. Very, uh, you know, very tough, uh, high trained, highly trained Japanese uh, crews. Uh, they they did not give up easily, but with attrition and um, a reduction in pilot quality over time. Uh, the Allies had little difficulty eventually in establishing aerial superiority over that area. You also have carrier-based attacks, um, most notably in November of 1943, when there were a couple of major carrier raids on Rabaul that con caused considerable damage. So the SBD dive bombers and um, uh, TBF torpedo bombers and F6F Hellcats all were involved in these uh, carrier strikes on Rabaul. You also have some really dramatic low-level attacks by aircraft flying out of Australia and New Guinea and other bases, um, the most uh, notable being the uh, gunships, the B-25 gunships, or sometimes called the strafers, that were fitted with multiple 50 caliber machine guns in the nose, I believe eight in the nose plus the upper turret. And then some of them had uh, uh, pods mounted on the forward fuselage so they could bring a lot of really heavy firepower to bear directly to the front. And they would come in at mast level, strafing all the way and then skip bomb ships. Uh, they were extremely effective in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea in March, and they were also effective right in Simpson Harbor. Uh, this photograph was from the very, uh, really notorious big attack on November 2nd of 1943. Uh, saw a lot of B-25s get shot down because they were just so low and relatively slow, and there were so many heavily defended uh, or heavily armed ships in the harbor and with the guns around the harbor. Uh, it was a pretty bloody day for the B-25s, but as you can see from all the smoke and flames, they, they actually did a lot of damage as well. And this is kind of the very representative of the, of the scenes that would have been uh, happening there at Rabaul on a, not a daily basis, but on a regular basis. These are clouds from uh, phosphorus bombs going off that were really effective against buildings and gun emplacements and troops. So that's really downtown Rabaul under attack by these phosphorus bombs. Uh, again, the ships in the harbor, this is the uh, Hagura, a, a heavy cruiser that was under attack. And uh, you could also see some direct hits on Japanese transports here. Uh, it, it, I wish that somebody would someday really, you know, make a, a good movie or miniseries out of this because the amount of, of combat and the variety of combat that took place in this one small area is pretty phenomenal. You have fighter versus fighter uh, combat over a ball for months. Um, this is just a photograph showing a damaged Corsair. 
after the pilot had a narrow escape and landed back at Torakina, um, people like Pappy Boynton and uh, the uh, uh, lots of you know lots of Medal of Honor winners, as a matter of fact, were involved here. The uh, probably the most famous would was Boynton because of the TV show, but also you have Richard Bong. Uh, some of his victories occurred over. Rabal, he flew several missions there in, in racking up his top scoring uh, uh, account of 40 aerial victories and becoming the top scoring fighter pilot of, uh, in American history. So Rabal was part of his legacy as well. Uh, it's really kind of hard to overstate how amazing the amount of combat and the variety of combat that took place in this one location really was over a long period of time, um, not continuously, but over more than three and a half years, Rabal was the focus of some really, really intense fighting. That's pretty much a thumbnail of the, of the whole uh, trilogy. Uh, I kind of skipped along through the the high points, because uh, I just wanted to sort of highlight that first book and the story of the Australian garrison. But I just wanted to give everybody an idea of what's out there. Um, there are other books as well, of course, that cover the Southwest Pacific, some really good ones. Uh, uh, I recommend some books on the Battle of the Bismarck Sea as well. So um, I think, Keegan, that that pretty much wraps up the presentation that I had planned, and I'd be happy to entertain whatever questions people might have. Well, Bruce, uh, thank you so much for, for taking us through that this evening. Um, I will say one of the interesting comments that we have received, uh, although it's a comment, not a question, uh, is thanking you for preparing these books um, because one of our viewers had an opportunity to read them as a prelude to a trip to Guadalcanal and Tulagi a few years ago. So they wanted to thank you for your great body of work. Um, I think one of the questions that that's probably on a lot of people's minds is is did it really work? The you know Rabal is often held up as as a great example of this island hopping strategy where we just kind of bypass it and, and move on. Um, but it doesn't sound as though we were ever really able to truly leave it alone. Um, were we? Were, were the efforts to cut it off successful? Um, it sounds like you know aerial combat engagements went on throughout the war you know, dozens of enemy aircraft are being shot down over the city. How are the Japanese resupplying it? And are we ever truly able to cut off Rabal? Uh, there's, there are two parts to that. The, the aerial combat pretty much was finished by February. And this is kind of amazing. By February of 1944, the aerial combat pretty much dried up over a ball as far as them having uh, the Japanese having any uh, remaining aircraft with which to defend the area. From that point on, it was a matter of flying missions over a ball to just interdict things like uh, trucks on roads. Um, the black sheep that I, you referred to when they finished their uh, you know, when, when the Japanese air aviation was basically done for, their missions almost became more dangerous because they were flying around at low altitude looking for trucks and targets of opportunity, and planes were still being shot down by any aircraft fire. So the short answer to your question is, yes, it, the Allied attempts to choke it off were successful. Um, the Japanese had a really difficult time being resupplied and they had extreme food shortages uh, to the point where the uh, allies were actually coming in and destroying whenever they would find a garden area or an area that looked like the Japanese were planting, they would actually come in and spray it with oil and, and just do these, do these kinds of missions that would, whatever they could to keep the Japanese from uh, from resupplying. There were attempts by the Japanese to actually bring in supplies by submarine, and even to the extent of the submarines towing uh, 
submerged cargo containers because anything that was above the surface, whether it was an aircraft or a ship, was easy pickings. The Allies had such a ring around Rabaul by mid-44 and beyond that the Japanese couldn't fly anything in or sail anything in. Uh, they basically had to get stuff in by submarine. I didn't even talk about the Allied POW camps that were on New Britain. Um, that's the real dark side of that whole uh, story. Uh, the Japanese had some really notorious camps there. Um, some run by the Kempitai, which is their uh, basically like their their state-run uh, secret police. And then they also had naval-operated POW camps that were manned by their what would be their equivalent of the Navy shore patrol. But when we think of shore patrol, we kind of think of some MPs with billy sticks. The Japanese shore um, guards were basically really well-trained troops that were organized for the defense of, of Japanese naval stations and naval uh, anchorages. And they had their own organization that was very effective. And they they ran a really brutal POW camp. Both the Kempitai and the naval camps committed atrocities, mass executions, uh, retribution killings. So if you were a prisoner at Rabaul, you didn't stand a very good chance. Uh, Happy Boynton was captured there. And the main reason why he survived is that he and six other high value prisoners were flown out of Rabaul up to Japan for further questioning. Of the others who were kept there on Rabaul, uh, there were a couple of hundred, mostly airmen imprisoned at Rabaul over the course of the war. And when the garrison, when the Japanese surrendered, there were only eight survivors, um, six Americans and I think a couple of um, New Zealanders. So six or eight, the number escapes me right now, but it was basically fewer than you can count on, on two hands. Um, so only that few survived those POW camps. I know that was a sideways answer to your question, but yeah, the the encirclement of Rabaul was highly effective. So uh, I think there's a, a couple of questions, Bruce, that have come in to kind of add to to what you were just describing. Um, what was the relationship between the Japanese and the native people of the island? Really good question. The Tolai natives uh, were like a lot of natives who were under the colonial rule of Australia, they were kind of subjugated. I mean, they weren't enslaved by any means, but they really weren't weren't paid wages, so to speak. It was just kind of a, uh, a relationship that had existed for a really long time. And, and the, the Australians had, you know, their, the, the typical Commonwealth attitude towards the native, they kind of regarded them as children. I know that sounds a little bit, um, uh, you know, not very kind, but but they sort of regarded the, the natives as not being intelligent. They were basically just a workforce. So at first, when the Japanese invaded, I think they, they did appeal to some of the natives uh, that, hey, now you have a new master here and things are going to get better. Uh, and some natives did buy in and would spy for the Japanese and and would turn over uh, allies who had bailed out. You know, if there was an airman who managed to come down in a native village or near a native village, sometimes they were uh, betrayed, if, if you would use that word from the allied point of view. But a lot of the natives also were abused and um, there were killings. Uh, the Japanese beheaded natives and, and made a big display out of it. So um, it was it was not a happy relationship, I would say, for the natives from either one, from the from the colonial Australians or the Japanese. Uh, it was a pretty complex, a complex and complicated relationship. Um, 
and I I think you know the natives just basically the Tolai people got the worst of it. I think that's a that's a fair assessment that there is this great sort of third faction that exists that's kind of getting getting a, a bug deal from both perspectives. Uh, Bruce, we've had a couple questions asked about the atrocities committed uh, with POWs. Knowing that the Tokyo trials were were not able to be as comprehensive as as say Nuremberg for a host of political reasons and in, in challenges identifying uh, Japanese you know committers of war crimes through limited record keeping and things like that. Uh, are you aware of of, of any uh, repercussions for those those folks that committed war crimes uh, at Rabaul? I did study some of those and um, there are just reams and reams and reams of papers of depositions mainly from the people who were flown out um, and also from the survivors. Um, those, those handful of American survivors certainly gave depositions. Um, they did identify some of the personnel. And, you know, I wish I had um, kind of prepared for that particular question because some of the names of the individuals escape me now on the uh, who were the Japanese leaders uh, but in in broad strokes the there really weren't many repercussions for the Japanese I I do want to say that there was one individual who was pretty much given the uh, accepted or or blamed for being responsible for the atrocities and Again, his name escapes me. And I want to say that he committed suicide by starvation in Japan after the war. But as far as um, like criminal criminal proceedings that resulted in punishment, uh, there really wasn't an equal, there wasn't a balance, you could say, for all the atrocities committed on New Britain and in those surrounding areas. I don't think there was much of a of uh, retribution per se. I think you, you picked up on, on, on a key sort of general theme of, of the prosecution of, of war crimes in the Far East, Bruce, which is in a lot of cases, uh, vital witnesses or, or the, the, those who had committed the acts themselves had chosen um, the path of suicide as opposed to um, either being captured by the allies or being brought before tribunal of any sort. Um, the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy um, go out, go through the entire war with just a, I guess it's almost fair to describe it as animosity between them uh, and a severely competitive streak that makes some of the inter-service rivalries in the States look kind of pedestrian. Um, are they collaborators in the defense of Rabaul or are there competing agendas or do they both participate? There, that existed, that, that, um, that rocky relationship certainly did exist. Interestingly, the South Seas Detachment had pretty good coordination. Um, and that was basically by imperial decree, I guess you could call it, that they were, they were strictly uh, more or less ordered to, to coordinate and cooperate with each other. Uh, and so they, you had the, the 144th uh, Infantry Regiment under uh, General Hori, and then the uh, fourth, I wanna say it was the fourth fleet under Admiral Kusaka that were the, the main components at Rabaul starting in 1942. And again, they, they did coordinate pretty well, which was not the norm. It, it, was, uh, it was a little bit unusual because you're right, Throughout most of the war, they they there was a good bit of animosity and inter-service rivalry. So the short answer is there was pretty decent coordination, and uh, they ran Rabaul as a in districts. There was a navy district and there was an army district. And interestingly, um, as as a sidebar to that, the Japanese brought in about three thousand. Um, what they called comfort women from Formosa and Korea. Uh, basically, the you know the the kind name was that they were geisha girls, but 
for all practical purposes, they were military um, conscripted prostitutes. And each of the services, they had what they called um, love houses in Rabal. Each service had their own. There were there were the army ones and the navy ones, and they didn't mix the two. So they were able to work things out, you know, with within that small area, and they coordinated when it came to construction and electricity and infrastructure. But other than that, I think they basically had, they did their own thing and uh, they tried to not step on each other's toes very much, Keegan, and that's about the simplest way to put it. I think uh, the, the story of comfort women is a very interesting one uh, with it being a bone of contention between many East Asian countries and Japan uh, at this point for, for Japan's failure to, to truly acknowledge uh, what they did in the, the sort of industrialization and militarization of, of illegal sex trafficking, uh, which is its its whole own story. Uh, Bruce, Rabal is often given as an example of this, you know, heavily fortified point that was bypassed intentionally uh, during island hopping. What were some of the others? I, I don't think any of them have maybe riv risen to the level of infamy uh, that that is attached to Rabal. W were there other places we we avoided that were that were similarly equipped? Um, not that jump out at me, but again, that you might have tossed me a curveball or a trick question there, Keegan, I'm not sure. Um, nothing stands out that would come close to a ball for its sheer size or the complexity of it as, as a fortress. Um, the Japanese had stockpiled enough material to last a six month siege and they had stockpiles scattered all through the jungles and in the hills and mountains surrounding Rabal. Um, so even after it was cut off from resupply, they didn't completely just wither on the vine. They were able to still survive. Um, and interestingly, they dug down because of the Allied bombing. The fact that Rabal was uh, such a volcanic area and there were there were th places where the ash piled up from that huge eruption that had caused the caldera collapse. There was ash piled up and compressed for you know 50 feet, so they could go down and tunnel easily into this um, solidified lava. So it was really easy to tunnel into, yet it was sturdy. And so they had this really intricate network of complete hospitals and command uh, in infrastructure. You know, the thing, what they talk about is Yamamoto's bunker. Um, I'm not sure that he ever really used that bunker, but it was sort of nicknamed after him. But they went underground. Um, they almost uh, like, uh, much like MacArthur at Corregidor, they were underground during the bombing and came out at night pretty pretty much or you know when there wasn't an air raid in, in progress. So they were able to pretty well hunker down in Rabal and I just don't think there was any other location, at least in the Southwest Pacific, that dictated the Allies uh, to go around like they did with Rabal. I mean, the Allied planners could recognize the difficulty that would have they would have incurred in trying an amphibious assault there. And they had learned their lessons already at Tarawa and Peleliu and places like that. That if those places were that bad, um, trying an assault on Rabal would have been not necessarily suicidal, but it would have been really, really bloody. And I just don't, I just can't think of anything um, in, you know, in the moment that would come anywhere close to Rabal for that kind of, uh, of characterization where it was just such a tough nut that nobody would really want to attempt to directly assault the place and, and invade it with uh, amphibious landings. 
Bruce, um, in explaining that, you kind of mentioned some of the facilities and, and unique characteristics of, of the ground there in Rabal. Um, perhaps for our, for our last question tonight, can you tell us a little bit about what remains of Rabal? I, I know that you yourself have not been able to visit Rabal, um, but can you maybe speak a little bit more about what you've been able to learn from, from your colleagues who have? Right. The um, There was actually another eruption there, I want to say in 1994, that caused a lot of extensive damage. And I'm not sure that Rabal ever recovered, the township ever really recovered from that. So as a tourist destination, I can't really speak to it in the modern sense, but I know people still travel there regularly who are fascinated with World War II history. There are numerous sunken shipwrecks so it's a, a real dive haven for scuba divers who want to go down and explore shipwrecks. Maybe not on the same parallel as Truck Lagoon, which I think has some nearly 200 shipwrecks. Um, I think Rabal has um, in the neighborhood of several dozen, though, and, uh, and sunken aircraft as well. Then you have that whole network of tunnels that I mentioned a very extensive network. Those are still in existence. They even had um, tunnels where the landing craft and barges that they were that they used so frequently for moving goods around by water. They had ramps going down to the water on rail tracks, and they could put these barges on dollies and and roll the barges up into these caves to be protected from bombing. So those are still in existence. Um, people can climb up to some of the gun emplacements that are on the mountains and on the peninsula around Rabal. There are a lot of war relics still just out there in the jungle. So it's got a real tremendous appeal as a, as a battlefield. Um, I think there was, back in the 1980s, uh, back when uh, there was a magazine called After the Battle that used to portray the then and now uh, parallels between b famous battlefields and what they looked like in the modern day. And there's one of those After the Battle uh, issues on Rabal that probably is still available you know, on eBay, but it, the uh, author did a really good job of, of highlighting what still existed now, yeah, that was about 30 or so years ago, but I don't think that much has been lost in that time. And there are a few attempts in different places around the Southwest Pacific to preserve those around Port Moresby uh, on New Guinea and there at Rabal and a few other places. There are some museums that try to uh, preserve some of those war relics. I hope I answered your question adequately with, with that. I think you did, Bruce. And, and to, to round us out tonight, uh, would you maybe tell us where we can procure copies of your excellent books? Sure. Um, the usual, uh, of course, is Amazon. That's the place to get, you know, the, the biggest discount that I'm aware of on, on, you know, with just their everyday pricing. Um, but the other other places like Barnes and Noble and uh, wherever you order books. Um, you can order these from uh, the publisher is Zenith Press. And as far as I know, they're still in print and still available. Well, uh, to echo your sentiment about Amazon, if you'd like to purchase these books and benefit the museum as well, I encourage you to purchase through Amazon Smile. It uh, keeps the book at the same affordable rate for you, but does give a small percentage of the purchase price back to the museum as a donation. You just have to select Military Aviation Museum uh, from the Amazon Smile program, and that's a great way to get a hold of these fantastic books, but also to uh, benefit the museum. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Keegan. It was a pleasure.